I'm excited to be here today. I hope you are. I hope you're all enjoying your summer so far. It's almost over. Kids back to school. Can I get a hallelujah? Amen. And my budget will be doing much better because I will not be feeding animals at home that spend, that eat. I, just, I never saw so much food in my life. Okay, I'm done. That's it. You know, speaking of kids, we develop a lot of things early on in our lives as children that we kind of carry through the rest of our lives. Some are good and some not so much. Some things you learned as a kid and nobody even had to teach you these things. Some beautiful things like kids getting excited. No one has to teach a kid how to get excited, to have fun. No one has to teach a kid how to have fun. Kids are curious. Nobody teaches them to be curious. They express themselves. Nobody has to teach them that. How children love, nobody has to teach them. And it's, that's, that's a beautiful picture because kids, they simply love like effortlessly. They don't, they don't know what's coming. They don't know that life's going to hand them some curveballs and that life's going to you know, have some disappointments and some headaches, and so they just love unconditionally. Yet, there are some things that we develop early in life that can be a hindrance to you and I as we get older. And no, not everything bad comes from your parents. You can't always blame mom and dad for everything. Listen, when, when, when kids are born, this is our job as parents, when you're born, you're, you're, you get a social security number, you're now what we call on the grid. And so if you're on the grid, our job as parents is to make sure that you somehow stay alive until you're 18. That's our job. And so, you know, we, we, we do the best. I mean, it's our job to get you to 18 and not push you off a cliff before that. Sometimes you deserve it. None of my kids are in service today, so we're good. But they are watching. Now, no, some of these traits that we learn early on, we learn on our, on our very own. We learn how to lie. We learn how to cheat. We could become lazy as children. You ever see kids that don't want to do anything? Disrespectful. Kids are disrespectful. Nobody taught them that. They just, it's in their nature. Kids bully each other. You ever see two little kids bully each other? It's our job as parents to correct those things. You see, we as parents, we can see those things happening, and so it makes it easier for us to address and correct a child's behavior. And then there's some things that we really can't see as they're developing. There's one in particular that you unintentionally develop that can actually be a deterrent as you try and grow into this thing called faith. As you and I try to push forward into our faith, we can be carrying baggage, especially this one thing that we're going to talk about today, with us into this journey, which can actually be a deterrent. This thing really surprised me, because I thought that this one thing was something that only people who had a lot of success in life developed. But we actually learned this one trait at a very young age. At a very young age, you and I develop an ego. Now, when I say that, you might immediately think, well, I don't have an ego. I'm not famous. I don't do things in front of people that would inflate my ego or make me have an ego. See, that's not always the case. If you look at the definition of ego, it's, it's a person's sense of self-esteem or self-importance. That's what an ego is. And we absolutely begin to develop that at an early age even though we don't fully understand it yet. And egos aren't just for inflated heads of famous people or those who have, you know, huge dreams and huge goals and they're pursuing them. That's, it's not just for them either. It can absolutely be that. But it's also for the people who hide in the shadows and don't do anything because they think of themselves, they're protecting their ego, so they never want to put themselves out there. You can also be on the side of having no aspirations or no dreams or, or anything else to, to, to seem like you're humble because your ego won't let you think highly of yourself. You can't possibly fail at doing anything. 
And so there's all these different ways that the ego comes into play. You can have an inflated ego. You can stand off in the corner because you don't want to uh, anyone to see you because you don't want your ego damaged. And then there's the third way where you just don't put yourself out there because you think, I don't want to, I again, don't want to damage my ego. And so why all this talk about ego today? Because we've been dealing with some hard stuff in this series, especially in the last couple of weeks, some stuff that's hard to ingest. Watching our mouths, watching our tongues, how we speak. Getting the right kind of wisdom in our life and not relying on our self-wisdom all the time. Last week we had a, a hard talk together. We learned why we fight and argue all the time. How many people fought and argued last week? All right, cool. We got, we got some honest people in this church. I'm trying to think if I fought or argued last week. We didn't fight. Or we, didn't, we don't normally fight. Did we argue? I don't think so. All right, it did pretty good. Talk, talk to me next week. It could be a completely different week. Yeah, the week's not over yet. <laughs> Thanks for the reminder. <laughs> it's a biblical week. It starts on Sunday, so technically it was over yesterday. And so it hit me this week that we all struggle a lot with all of these things that we've been learning. Why are they such a struggle? Because it, it requires us to fully submit ourselves to a different lifestyle, to a godly lifestyle, to a change in how we operate. And it very well could be our egos that are holding us back from submitting to this new life that you and I have been given. For some, they only submit to a godly life, to trying uh, this faith thing on. They only submit for, let's say, an hour and five minutes, 10 to 11.05 on Sunday mornings. There's 168 hours in a week. If you're only submitting to trying to live out a godly, faith-filled lifestyle for only one of those 168 hours, do you really think you're going to get somewhere? Do you really think it's going to make a difference? Or will you get frustrated with all the topics that we talk about, all the discussions that we have together to try and better ourselves? Will you just get frustrated and think, you know what, this just doesn't work. Maybe I'll try again next Sunday for an hour. That's a no-win pattern. And that will eventually lead you to believe that the Christian faith doesn't work because you keep failing at it. And we are allowed to fail. I say that all the time. We are allowed to fail. As long as you're humble. And that's where your ego comes in the most. Becoming humble with an elevated ego is almost impossible. In order to get this right, you and I need to become humble. Remember the scripture we closed out with last week was James 4, 6. It says this, but he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. So in order to become humble, we cannot let our egos get in the way. As we resist the appeal of the world, according to this scripture, God extends more and more grace upon us. Now, in the past, you may have heard a lot of church folk, a lot of church preachers, they use the word pride, and I get it. We are a prideful people, and that also is why we can't submit to a faith-filled lifestyle. But I've come to not like that word as much because it's so easy for someone to say, I'm not prideful. I'm humble. Look at me. I'm not, I'm not fancy at all. I don't drive a fancy car. I don't have a fancy house. I'm as humble as they come. Well, I've got a newsflash for you. I've seen some of the most humble, not prideful people on the outside have some of the biggest egos I've ever seen on the inside. So I want us to look at today's scriptures from James not from the angle of my pride, because again, nobody wants to admit that they're prideful, but from the angle of this. Here's the question I want you to ask yourself. Is my ego getting in the way of submitting myself to living out a godly lifestyle to the best of my ability? I want you to ask yourself this, that question as we pursue today. Maybe by looking at it from this angle, it won't be so easy to dismiss today's word 
just because you don't like the word pride and you immediately tune out because you say, I'm not a prideful person. But we've already determined we all have an ego up to some point. So let's dive in. Pastor James, hit us. We're ready for it. We're open. Here we are still in James chapter 4. We're going to start off with verse 7. It says this. There's that word. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. And so because of verse 6, where God extends more and more and more grace to the humble, we do verse 7. That's why I said submit yourselves then. It's almost like a therefore. Like because of verse 6, you should do this. And since God opposes the proud but shows favor and grace to the humble, this becomes very important for us. We don't like the word submit or submission either. See, submission is not the same as obedience. We tend to tie the two together. Submission actually means to yield control to a more powerful or authoritative entity. Obedience is the act of obeying, the practice of obeying. So we can say this, submission leads to obedience. And rather than resisting God's word for us, we should be resisting the things of the world obediently. Remember last week's verse we ended with, it says, don't you know that friendship with the world means enemy against God? See, James knows that the devil has already gotten a foothold on some of the people he's writing to. So that's why he's been pretty stern in some of his wording. And he's going to be again today. The people he loves, the people he cares for, the people that he's writing this letter to have absolutely been led astray. That's why the outcome of the command in this verse to submit and then resist The outcome of that is the action of the devil fleeing. I want you to take notice of the pattern, though. First, submit. Why? Because you'll need God's strength to follow the next command of resist. First, submit. See, here's the thing. We don't do it this way. We don't do it this way at all. We like to take the hard way. That's that's our human nature. We take the hard route every single time. Now, if you're one of those people who come to church or you're watching online today and you tune out about 10 minutes in or you want to go scan through your phone or whatever, that's totally fine. But I want you to at least leave here today with this idea, this point. Because usually the first thing we do in our lives when we get into a situation is we do the opposite. We resist, we resist, we resist. And we try and we try. And we may be able to resist for a while. Whatever it is you're fighting right now, you may be able to resist it for a while. You may be able to push it to the side for a while, but eventually we lose the battle. And then it's at the point where we ask for God's help. Right? We say, God, I just can't get through this. God, I just can't do this anymore. We try our hardest to resist on our own strength. And James is telling us, you're doing it in the wrong order. First, submit yourself to God. Fall under His care. Fall under His power. Fall under His mercy. Fall under His grace. And then together in union with God, you fight your battle. The outcome when you do it that way is one that you could have never achieved on your own. Because our scripture just told us, if you follow that pattern, submit, resist, guess what? It has to flee from you. We need to get out of the pattern of of doing it on our own. It just doesn't work. There are some battles that you guys are fighting and that even I fight in my life sometimes that are just too hard, and I burn myself out resisting, resisting, resisting when I could have just submitted first and let God fight my battle. And so whatever your struggle, whatever mountain that you can't climb, whatever seems impossible for you on your own strength, submit, resist, and then watch him flee. Leave here today with at least that. I mean, I hope you still tune in, but in case you don't, Because honestly, that's enough right there 
for, for me personally, that's enough for me to work on forever. Because I can't seem to get out of that habit sometimes. And if I deal with it, I know you guys deal with it. I know people watching online deal with it. it, it we just, we take, we take the hard road. And God is very clear. Give it to me. Submit to me first. And then watch whatever you're dealing with flee from your life. Think of it like a new military recruit. In order to fight the enemy, right, you're coming into the military for the first time. You're a new recruit. And in order to fight the enemy, you first have to do what? You have to submit to the people who are training you, the people who have the experience, the people who know much, much more than you and are much power, more, more powerful than you. And then as a team together, you try and defeat the enemy. But even then, sometimes they get defeated. We don't win every battle in the military. But here's the great thing about submitting to God and going into battle with him. He can't lose. Never has. Never will. And so the first thing to do is to submit to God. So let's explore that a little, because what does submit ourselves to God actually look like? Because I, I'm, I, I can't go through life not using any of my own experiences or any of my own knowledge or any of the gifts God gave me and just submit everything to God. I'm unique. You're unique. I'm different. You're different. What does God want me to do when I submit myself? Here's the thing. God's not asking you to abandon you altogether. He created you with your individual thoughts, your passions, and your gifts. God's not asking you to be a robot to him. He could have easily just made us all robots. Think of it this way. Think of it like a computer, like an operating system. Every computer is unique and filled with different things, but it needs an operating system to run well. You can do you, but let God be the operating system for your entire life. Imagine for just a second that you're a Mac person and not a PC person. That's what a godly life looks like. That was a joke for Mac people. <laughs> like nobody, like... <laughs> Listen, the Mac operating system just runs a lot better than PCs. If you're a real Christian, you would say amen to that. <laughs> Just think of it that way, though. Think about the way an operating system, every, every computer is unique, but it needs an operating system. God wants to be that operating system in your life through everything you do. He's not asking you to forfeit who you are. He's not asking you to be some Christian robot that just walks around like this going, I submit, I submit, I submit. It's a lifestyle. Yet we, we too often feel torn and conflicted because so many life lessons we get from this world teach us why we shouldn't submit to anything. We're proud, especially people here in America, right? We're proud. We don't submit to anybody. We learn things like, you know, here's why you don't submit, because you want control. I want control. I decide my own destiny. What does that do? Ignores God. We operate sometimes out of fear. I'm going to seize the opportunity now because it may not come around again. Meanwhile, God has, has put it perfectly plain in your life to wait for his perfect plan. Distrust. We learn not to trust anybody anymore. And so guess what? We don't trust, naturally, we don't trust God. Security. I take measures to protect or secure myself which, again, will teach me not to rely on God. It's easy to fall for those kinds of deceptions because on the surface, they, they sound clever. and They seem like, wow, that's the truth. That's the way I should be operating. And when you and I don't make it a point to, to learn about God's loving and perfect nature and form the habit of submitting every aspect of our life to living out a godly life on a daily basis, we fall into a really bad pattern. Here's something pivotal I want you to understand about this whole thing. Full submission to God is a lifestyle. It's not circumstantial. It's not based on how you're doing today. 
I'm really struggling today. Let me, let me, let me see what it looks like to submit this to God today. Full submission is not motivated by external circumstances, but our love and reverence for God. It's a lifestyle that submits our heart and soul and minds to God. So what does it look like to submit ourselves to God? I, I thought, let, let's just, again, because the, the idea of submission or submitting is, is an odd one for some. It's, it's an odd one for me still. I want to keep control of so much. So let me give you a couple points on what that might look like. For you points people, you're going to be happy today. First one is this. Submit your heart. The heart is our moral compass. It steers our value and choices. In order for our hearts to be transformed, to have a, a, we have to have a good conscience and a sincere faith. We need to submit the current condition of our heart for God to renewal. The Bible describes those who harden their hearts and refuse to submit to God as lacking, lacking reverence or, or fear of God. And we're warned by many other scriptures that this will cause problems for us later. It has to be the current condition of your heart. When we talk about submitting your heart to God, here's what we're not talking about. Waiting around until you think you can get everything right in your life. Because I got, I got this may shock you, It'll never happen. You will never get everything right. I will never get anything right. God wants your heart now in its current condition. That's the kind of heart God can work with. He's not waiting for you to be perfect. He knows you'll never be. So submit your heart to him now. Here's another one. Submit your sinful tendencies. We don't even like to admit that we have sin sinful tendencies. The Bible describes those things as a form of like a spiritual sickness when our moral compass, our moral center has been corrupted. And as a result, our hearts harbor these sinful intentions, hatred, envy, lust. And we may be able to hide our intentions from other people or deceive ourselves into thinking that they're not really an issue, but God sees right through all your disguises. In order to be uh, relieved of our evil conscience and our tendencies to to live out these sinful actions, we need to go back to the first point I just said, and again, submit your heart. You want to get rid of those sinful tendencies that you have, those thoughts that you have? Submit your heart to God. Here's a third one. I'm giving you three points so far. Three. Submit your selfish motives. That ties right, right into our word of the day, ego. Every human being has an ego. We enjoy being admired and maybe, you know, even serving others to look and to feel good. And where we have been driven by self-centered motives in the past, we now need to put them down before Jesus and decide to glorify him only. You don't need any recognition for the good things you're doing. You don't need any recognition and God knows our motives when we do. So let us therefore follow Jesus' example and submit to God by by dying to those selfish natures that we have in our pride and putting our egos aside. Here's a fourth point. Submit your personal standards. See, many of our standards about what we feel is acceptable are dictated by the world. And with Jesus in your life now, if you're a believer in Jesus, or if you're just here today just even exploring faith, or thinking about, you know, what is this all about? You need to understand this, that our personal standards differ very a lot from the way God thinks. And so we need to submit our personal standards no matter what the world says. Because sometimes we compromise God's standards for the world's standards because we just feel more comfortable with them. And we're so used to them. But if we're going to submit, if we're going to really give this faith thing an honest shot, these are the things that we need to submit. Here's a fifth one. We're on a roll today. Five-point sermon so far. <laughs> submit your soul. The soul is the part of us that is eternal and defines who we are as individuals. It embodies our unique identity, our, our, our ambitions, our memories, our emotions. 
The Bible calls us to purify our souls from sin and be born again through the Holy Spirit and God's Word. Otherwise, our souls will die. Uh, six. Let's do six points. We go to six? Submit your ungodly desires. When God created individuality, He chose our desires. He designed us with certain desires. These desires were meant to bring Him glory on earth and spread his goodness to those around us. Do you realize the gifts that you've been given aren't just for you? The, the gifts that you and I have been given, that God put in each of us, that's why we're individually all unique. The gifts you have, whether it's, it's teaching or art or whatever your gift may be, it was designed and put in you by God to ultimately bring him glory. That's why when you find people who use their gifts for God, you'll never find a happier person. Such ungodly desires that we don't get rid of corrupt our souls, and we can't overcome ungodly desires on our own strength. Thank God that He is faithful, and He will help us conquer them when we confess and submit them to Him. And so this is how we can become more godly, by not trying harder to do more and more things, by moving our egos and pride out of the way and submitting. It winds up, it's God who transforms us and makes us new. Here's the seventh one. <laughs> I'm getting to Charles Stanley territory now. I think he does 12. <laughs> Submit your shame and pain. Talk about things we hold on to that don't help us move forward. Our souls can be weighed down, worn out, and infected by unresolved negative emotions. Instead of rejecting us, God will restore us if we submit those things to him. Our sorrows, our grievances, our shame... See, the world will reject you when you're struggling. When you're struggling with something, the world tends to push you aside. But God never will. Because Jesus endured great humiliation as he hung there naked on the cross on our behalf. And so he understands every indignity that humanity has ever suffered. Therefore, he is our perfect comforter and redeemer. So submit your shame, and your pain to him. You got room for one more? You getting all this? You writing all this down? Submit your mind. I'll finish with this one. I'm not done with the sermon. Don't get excited. Just with points. <laughs> Just with points. I know you're already preparing your lunch meal. <laughs> the mind is the processor. It's kind of like the storehouse where we store all our beliefs and our ideas. It's where we form reasoning and imagination and rationality. And Satan tempts us to focus our minds on worldly things, and he bombards us and bombards our minds with temptations and lies and accusations and hatred. Our enemy knows that if he can corrupt the direction of our minds, we will struggle to submit to God. So that's just a small picture of just some of the things that you and I need to submit to God. That's just eight things. I'm sure there's hundreds. And that's just one scripture. Look at the beginning of James 8. James 8 says this, come near to God and he will come near to you. Again, another idea that requires action on our part. And again, look at the order. We first do something and then God does something. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Our actions first followed by God's. That's the, that's the pattern here. The readers of James' letter have seemed to drift far away from God. And they begin to follow their own desires and, and the things of their, their world of that day. And so the action on our part is to come near to God and he will come near to us. This is an action that we sometimes, we think we can't do. This comes, if you're not submitting all those eight things that we talked about earlier, here's some of the things you tell yourself in your head. I can't come to God right now. I can't come near to God now. I'm not in the right frame of mind to come to God. I've drifted so far, I'm actually embarrassed to draw near to God. I haven't prayed in months. How can I draw near to God? God's forgotten little old me. 
Since I've seemed to forget him, I haven't thought about God for years now. I'm sure he's forgotten about me. And that's all you and I thinking of these things in our own mind because that's how we handle things. Think of it this way. Someone drifts from our lives. Everybody has that person in your life that has gone so wrong that you drifted away. There's no more relationship left. They just can't come strolling back in. It can take years for you to let someone back into your life that walked away from you or hurt you. But we're not God. We don't act like God. We don't handle things like God. We don't harbor things like God. So I love this verse, not because it's so much a command, but it's a promise. In any stage of your life, draw near to Him. Come near to Him. Come near to God. And what's the promise? He will come near to you. Whatever has hurt you the most in this life, whatever has disappointed you the most in this life, whatever worldly habit or sin you've gotten yourself caught up in, the promise from God is come to me and I will come to you. We picture God running from us with all of our junk, don't we? Because that's what we do. We see other people who are a mess and we back up and we back away. We go into that, like I've used the example before, we go into that other aisle in the supermarket. Come on, you know that. You're in the supermarket, you see somebody you know has got some heavy stuff, you go in the other aisle real quick. All of a sudden, you're looking at things you absolutely don't need in that aisle because you're hoping that they pass you by. And you, you ever notice that that never works? You can go on the other side of the store and look at windshield wipers, even though you, your car doesn't need them. Well, they're in the milk section, and you're thinking, wow, they got to be done by now. And so you start walking back, and you come face to face with them. That doesn't only happen to me. I mean, I don't do that. I, I see people, I, I run right towards them. I'm like, I know it's Tuesday morning, but give me your junk right now. Let's hear it. Not God. That's how we handle people. God says, turn your face to me, come in my direction, and I come to you. That's beautiful. Now James is going to kind of crank up the heat again real quick. Verse, uh, the rest of verse 8 says, Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Man, I think like, okay, James, you, you know, all this great stuff, come, you know, come to God and, you know, turn to God and he'll come to you. And then he's like, and, and you know what? Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. I, I struggled with this. I'm like, man, if I could just end the sermon right there, like what a positive note, you know? And so when James is talking about washing your hands, it's, it's, a, it's a command. And he's calling out the people he's writing to. See, the people he's writing to have seemed to have drifted far from a godly lifestyle. And so this command to wash your hands and to begin to purify yourself, and again, watch the order of things. Wash your hands is an action. It's a, it's a symbol of, I'm beginning, you know, we're going to start here. When you, when it's the first thing you do. You wash your hands when you go in the house. You wash your hands to begin to, to purify. Then he backs that right up with the action that that needs to happen first. Why? Because they're all sinners. We're all sinners. We all fall short. James uses the term double-minded, which if you remember way back in the beginning of the series, in chapter 1, he uses the word double-minded, but he's using it a little bit different here. Here he's using it to remind them that for too many reasons and for far too many circumstances, they have been trying to live with one foot in God's world and one foot into worldly things. I feel like this is such a huge problem for people's faith today. James reminds them that because of this, they should wash their hands of all of it and get that one foot out of the world and back into the realm of things of God. In order for this faith lifestyle to work, in order for it to work, in order for it to work to, it, to its full potential, you and I have to be all in. We, we can't live our lives with one foot in the world and one foot in the church. We can't live our lives with, with half the world 
being our operating system and then God being the other half. We, we don't operate well like that. But for far too long, I, I, I mean, I hear what James is saying. I hear kind of the, the angst in, his, in the tone of his letter. He's saying, come on. Look at verse 9. He's saying, again, he hits him hard. Grieve, mourn, wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Man, on the surface, that seems a bit extreme. Five commands in there that seem way out there. What do you mean? God, does, God just wants me to grieve, wail, and mourn? God doesn't want me to laugh or have joy? Who wants to sign up for that? Of course, that's not what he's meaning here. This is why it's so important to remember the context of what you're reading. James's readers strayed far into the things of this world. Their lives have now been consumed with the pleasures that the world has to offer. That fake persona of always being joyful. Always laughing as if the world has just been so good to them. That they're filled with joy as if the world is really filling that joy meter in your life. So these five commands may seem a bit harsh and out of line. Unless you're trying to get somebody you love back into a right relationship with God. All of a sudden they don't seem so harsh, do they? That's James's readers in this text here. And that holds true for people today, especially like the people in our text, people who have turned far from God, people who, who love, who, who he loves and who we love, who have dropped their one strong faith for the things that this world has to offer. I know you know some of them because I know some of them. Think about them for a moment and I'll close with this. Don't they always have that facade up of how great life is? always laughing, always seeming joyful, as if the choice they made to abandon their faith, abandon their church family, whatever excuse happened, whatever happened in their life that made them turn, that God has done, you know, they abandoned their faith in God and now the world has done so many wonderful things to them. Look how happy I am. Look how great life is going for me. Look how much I'm smiling. Look how joyful I am. So James's words to them may sound harsh, but he's serious because he wants them to turn their lives back to God so that they don't become blinded by the fake joy and the fake laughter that is in their lives. And so he's telling him that facade you put on, that you're always happy and you're never sad, you're never mourning for anything, everything's always good. He's telling them to, to turn that around, turn it, turn it into those things so you can hand it back over to God. And then he finishes up with this verse, which ties into all of them. Verse 10 says this, Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Again, look at the pattern. Our action first. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will lift you up. God shows favor to the humble. The humble is in this verse again too. Humble yourself and draw near to him, and he will draw near to you. That was last week. Humble yourselves and he will lift you up. That's this week. The things of this world, the things that your flesh desires, the things you feel like you just can't give up in life, all of those things can never, ever do the things that those couple of verses can do for you in your life. No matter how far you've gone, follow that pattern. Follow that pattern and just watch your life change. Drop that ego you developed as a kid and become humble and draw near to him and he will meet you and guess what? You will be lifted up. Now let me ask you, do you think this is just a one-time fix? Do you think you can come to God one time and get this all right? To, to drop your ego and come humbly before God? I mean, how many times are we going to fall for the things of this world and need to be lifted up back by God. You might think, well, I've done this so many times in my life, God's probably done with me. I'm here to tell you today that that's a lie from the pit of hell. If coming to God humbly for restoration in your life was only a one-time thing, you and I would not be sitting here today because I wouldn't be here. 
So be humble. Draw near to him. He'll meet you and you'll be lifted up. And here's the beautiful part. He will draw near to you and lift you back up again and again and again. Just ask him. God, will you meet me here again? You know, I'm embarrassed, God. Sometimes I can't believe I fell for it again. I can't believe I fell into that temptation again. I can't believe I'm still battling the thing I prayed about three years ago. God, will you meet me here again? I've fallen so many times and and gotten back up. So I'm asking you, God, will you meet me here again? And God's only response when you come to him humbly is yes. I will meet you here again. I will meet you in the darkest of times. I will meet you here again and again and again and again. Father, we thank you for that. We thank you that there's no limit on us coming to you. We thank you that our unhumble selves and our ego sometimes get in the way of doing it, Lord. But when we we come to you, you promise that you will meet us in our darkest and most desperate times. Thank you for your word today and your reminder of that. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand?